Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. This is our Sunday Isaiah study. We're in, in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 3. I know that Bill, in my absence, had covered all the way to chapter 5 and had done the questions. So the questions are done, but we want to cover some things in the text that we're going to be covering, and so that's where we're going to start. So before we start, let's have ourselves a word of prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for all that you do for us, for the way you take care of us, provide for us, and give us everything that we need. We pray, Father, that as we are studying and thinking about your word, that you would help your Holy Spirit to enlighten us so that we might be filled with your spirit and be able to understand you and your relationship with us better and our relationship with you so that we might please you in all that we do. We pray that you're glorified in all things, and we thank you for Isaiah the prophet who wrote what he wrote. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that inspired him, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit that preserved it so that we might have it and be able to glean information from it. We praise you and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in Isaiah chapter 4, and in Isaiah chapter 4, we started a section that dealt with uh, the branch of the Lord. That started in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 2, and basically it's a contrast between the present condition of Israel, which, where's my clicker here? The present condition of Israel, which is to, uh, which is right here, in our paper right there is the present condition of Israel when Isaiah is preaching and Israel the ten northern tribes are going off into captivity or have gone off into captivity as Isaiah writes and as a re result of that uh, Israel as the nation of God doesn't look very very holy doesn't look very faithful to God and so in chapter 4 and verse 2 he begins to tell us what's going to happen when the branch comes up and the branch is referring to Jesus over here when Jesus comes, and remember what city Jesus was from? What city was he from? Nazareth. Anybody remember what I told you about the word Nazareth? It meant the branch. And so Jesus is the branch. He's called the branch. And so he comes from the city of the branch, you might say. And he's the branch. And when he comes, and when he becomes king, there's going to be a different kind of kingdom. And he points out in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 2, In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful, and glorious in the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. And so what he's saying is that when the branch comes, there will be survivors of Israel, and they will be the ones that are considered beautiful. And so what that means is they're the ones that are holy and righteous. Uh, and so we already looked at that in verse 3. He said, it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded in uh, recorded for life uh, in Jerusalem. And of course, we understand that as we're reading this, sometimes we look at it at, from a physical standpoint, and here as Israel is being carried off into captivity, there's nobody left recorded in their, uh, in their social records or in their, in their uh, um, what's a good word for it, in, in their county records, you might say, as who's alive and who's dead because they're all taken captive. And so there's a sense in which you know, you look at this from a physical standpoint, but really he's not talking about the physical people who are left, but he's talking about those who are going to be left when the Messiah comes over here in Jesus' rule and reign. And we notice that the very first people to obey the gospel were who? Jews. And how many of them? 3,000. There was 3,000, at least in, in Acts chapter 2, there were 3,000. And so they're called the holy ones. They're called the, the faithful. They're called the beautiful ones. Uh, because that's what God refers to, and that's what God means when he's talking here about those who are left and who's, who's recorded in the book of life. This isn't the physical book of life in Jerusalem, but it's the, the spiritual book of life that God has and that God talked about in, in um, Revelation chapter 20, where God talks about the lake of fire, and those who are going to be thrown in there are those whose names are not written in the book of life. And, of course, that's God's book of life, and that's what's under consideration here from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, and so as we, uh, as we take a look at this, it says in Isaiah chapter 4 and 4, When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughter of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of, of Mount Zion and over her assembly a cloud by day, even smoke and the brightness of the flaming fire by night, for, for over all for over all, the glory will be a canopy. And so as he talks about this, this picture that he's talking about, uh, he says what has to happen because Israel over here 
during the time of Isaiah's day is so filthy and terrible that God had to wash them away. And the, and the way he did that when, from a physical standpoint was he led that, them into Assyrian captivity. But really, it's not even talking about that. It's talking about this over here when Jesus comes, sets up his kingdom. And as a result of him setting up his kingdom, one of the things that he gets to do is he gets to purge Israel from their sins and wash them clean and pure. And so if you go to Isaiah chapter 1, and you look here as Isaiah is start. I'm sorry, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter one, and as you uh, as Hebrews is talking about the fact that uh, Jesus is in fact the Messiah, uh, he says in Hebrews one and verse three, and he is the radiance of his glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. And so before Jesus sat down on the right hand in heaven and sent the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Before he did that, when he was on the cross and, and through his, his death, burial, and resurrection, he, he, it represents the judgment of God on the faithful of Israel who believe in the cross, who come to the cross, and represent them coming to the cross by being baptized in Jesus' name because Jesus died and was buried. And so those people who accept the message of the cross are baptized like Jesus because they're dead to sin, they're buried in water, and they're raised to walk in newness of life. And that's exactly the same thing that you have here. So this washing that he's talking about is done during the time of the branch and during the time that the, the Messiah comes, and he's, he's going to cleanse them from all of their sins and from all of their iniquity. And that's what he has reference to over here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 4, when he washes away the filth and purges the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the, spirit, by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. The idea of the spirit of judgment is that God makes a judgment. He makes a decision. Sometimes we, I think we fail to understand the difference between the judgment and, and the verdict or the, the punishment. Uh, when, when you're in a court of law and you're being tried for some crime, and they convict you of the crime, you still haven't received your judgment. Mm -hmm. You've received whether you're guilty or innocent, right. but you haven't received your judgment. Right. That the, the judge, depending on the trial, might say, well, come back in a week and the court will give you their judgment. Right. And when they give you the judgment, the court says, because you are guilty, our judgment is that you face 20 years in prison. That's the judgment. And so here, the, the judgment of the consideration is the idea that God makes this judgment, this, this decision of what is necessary for them to get right with God. And he says it's by the spirit of burning. And in other words, God is going to punish them. That's the idea of burning in the scriptures, God's judgment or God's burning. That's why when Jesus was raised, uh, was raised in his, um, I'm sorry, before Jesus was raised and people would ask um, John who Jesus was, what would he, uh, what would he tell them? Yeah, okay, he's the one greater than I am, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he's the one that's going to judge you, and he's the one that can bless you. And so judge, that fire is the idea of judgment, and so he's bringing them on them the spirit of judgment. And so the spirit of judgment is that they're condemned because they're sinners. But because they're condemned, God still wants to save them. And so in Jesus and on the cross, they get their sins washed away if they believe him and trust him. And so as a result of that, he says in verse 5, then the Lord will, will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assembly a cloud by day, even smoke, uh, and, a uh, um, and the brightness of a flame of fire by night for, all, uh, for over all the glory will be a canopy. And you might say, well, what in the world does that refer to? Well, really what that refers to is that refers to Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. And here's Israel, they're wandering in the wilderness, there's lots of people wandering in the wilderness, right? And they're God's people, and God's tabernacle was there, the, the, the tent of meeting was there, and that was the tabernacle where they would go in, and they had the, the, the uh, uh, items of the, of the tabernacle, uh, and over all of them was this cloud by day, and this cloud at night would turn into what? Fire. So that's what it has reference to. So uh, over all of God's house, over all of God's kingdom, is going to be God who's going to be giving them light during the night and is going to be giving them warmth at night. 
and is going to be protecting them from the heat in the day. In other words, it represents God's protection of his people who are faithful to him. And so Israel over here, when they become Christians in Acts chapter 2, God promised to take care of them. Now, even though many of them died physically as a result of persecution, what was God doing? He was taking care of them because none of them were, were spiritually lost. Uh, God still has them. And they're saved. And so that's the idea of the canopy that's under consideration. It is a, a picture of God, of Jesus, um, or of God leading them in the wilderness. And he had that, that uh, pillar of fire by night and the pillar of smoke by day. But you have to understand the pillar did, didn't go up. It went up and out and covered the people so that God was protecting them and taking care of them. And that's the reason sometimes they could uh, do what was necessary in the evening. But that's, that's what he has reference to here, and it represents God's, God's care of them. Now, uh, notice that he says it's going to be over the mountain of Zion. Zion just simply is a, is a figure or a representation for, for what? God's people are actually God's rule or kingdom over God's kingdom. That's what Zion represents. Zion represents the rule of God, the mountain of God. Remember we saw that in Isaiah 2, the mountain of the Lord's house? That's what Zion represents. So over God's rule, he's going to be taking care of his people. Whereas over here, in during the time of Isaiah, what was happening to supposedly God's people? They were going off into captivity. Well, why? Because they weren't being faithful to God, and therefore the the sacrifice of Jesus would be ineffective for them because they're not being faithful to God. Now, during this time, there was some, there was the, the faithful remnant, and to them, the death of Jesus would ultimately pay for their sins and their crimes, and that's why in Ephesians chapter 4 and about verse 11, it says that Jesus led captivity captive. Remember all that? Yeah. All right. Uh, and so in verse 6, he says, there will be shelter to give shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. And so he's pointing out that that idea of the canopy, God leading them, is the idea of God taking care of them, God blessing them, God giving, giving them everything that they need while they're under his rule and under his uh, dominion, he's going to bless them. And so that's, that's what we have in, in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse, uh, down to verse 6. Anybody have any questions or anything you might like to ask about that section that maybe I or Bill didn't cover? All right. As we get into chapter 5, he really hasn't changed his subject. I mean, he hasn't changed his, his theme, but he's, ch he's changing his figure. And here in Isaiah chapter 5, he's using the figure of a vineyard. And I'm sure as you answered those questions that you realize that it's a, the figure of a vineyard that's under consideration. And as a, as a result of that, uh, let's do some reading here in chapter 5. I know you read it, but let's go over a little bit, a little bit of time. Uh, in Isaiah 5, verse 1, he says, Let me sing now uh, for my well-beloved a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile field or, or, or on a fertile hill. And so here it represents this uh, vineyard. And Isaiah is saying, I'm, uh, I want to sing to you about my beloved's vineyard. His beloved would be God. And the vineyard of God would be the people of God. In this case, this was supposed to be the vineyard of God. This physical nation of Israel was supposed to represent God, and they were supposed to be his people. But they really weren't doing what he said. Uh, and, and so therefore, that's what caused the trouble. Now, from verses 2 uh, down to about verse oh. Uh, down to about verse 4, he's going to tell us about the care that God took with his vineyard. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, you probably have, they're all over the place around here, but if you're going through the countryside, you'll notice vineyards. And some of the vineyards, uh, they're just getting ready to plant them. And so when you drive by one time, you'll see maybe stakes laid out where the rows are going to be. And then you drive by another time and you see little sticks. And you drive by another time and you see the poles going across and the wires going across. And then you drive by again, you see, see the, them, the little plants that are in there. If you actually don't even see them planting, or maybe you see them planting. And so you, you see how the farmer is taking care of his vineyard and preparing it and getting it re ready. 
And so it says in verse 2, he dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with a choice vine, and he built towers in the, in the midst of it, and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected uh, to produce uh, good grapes, but it produced only worthless grapes. Now, here's what I want you to understand. God didn't make this world just to leave it here and receive nothing from it. When you make something, when you actually make something, do you make it for the purpose of just throwing it away? Now, even if you make it for the purpose of throwing it away, before you throw it away, you use it for a purpose. Use it for a reason, right? Uh, sometimes you have to make a template in order to make something, and then you can get rid of the template, but you use the template because you, you needed it, and then you didn't need it anymore. So God is making a God made the world. God isn't just making the world say, okay, I made the world, I'm going to leave now. God is expecting to get something from it. It's his vineyard. Now, in the New Testament, who's the vineyard? The church is. We are. We're the vineyard. We're, we should be adding to the vineyard of God as we go out into the world, but we're his vineyard. In this time, the vineyard was Israel. Israel was God's vineyard. And they're supposed to be bringing people to uh, God, if you remember when God first called uh, Israel, he said, I'm going to make you a nation of what? Anybody remember? I'm going to make you a nation of priests. Of priests. Now, what do priests do? Priests bring, pe bring people to God. Priests bring the sacrifices of the people to God. So if we're priests, what do you think we're supposed to be doing? Bringing people to God. What do you think we're supposed to be doing with our children? Bringing them to God. What are we trying to do with our friends? Bring them to God. Why are we doing that? Because we're his vineyard. He expects something from us. So church isn't something you get into and go, okay, I made it. I'm going to sit here and I'm done. It's a vineyard. It's supposed to produce something, whether fruit in your life or bringing fruit in another way. That These also explain the parables that Jesus talked to them about when he talked about the, the vineyards and, and the fact that, that uh, God had a vineyard and he wasn't receiving his produce from them. You remember right. when Jesus was talking about those vineyards? Right. Uh, uh, he, he said there was a, a husbandman that had a vineyard and he rented it out, remember? Right. And, and he didn't get the fruit that he was supposed to get, so what did he go do? He went and destroyed it, right? And he, he lent it out to somebody else. Well, we're the people he lent it to. Here's the first people that he's referring to. They were supposed to be the, the vineyard of, of the Lord, and they didn't produce fruit, so God took it from them and gave it to the Gentiles. We're the Gentiles. So that's what's under consideration here when he's talking about this vineyard. Right, he says in verse 3, he says, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. He says, so So I want you guys to consider what's happening in my vineyard. Now, remember, why, did he, why does he have a vineyard? To produce fruit, okay? The, the, the Lord put us here because he wanted to receive glory. He wanted to receive honor. He wanted to receive fruit. He, he wanted to receive some recognition. Very few people make something and say, I want you to think it's awful and terrible. They make something, and what do they expect you to say? Oh, that's nice. You made that? Wow, that's, that's clever. That, you know, whatever. That's what you expect. If you make dinner, what do you expect your family to say? This is terrible, it's awful, I hate it. Is that, is that why you make dinner? Why do you make dinner? So it nourishes them, and we hope that they liked it. We, we hope that they, oh, this is good, Mom. You know, make this next time, too. Right? Well, that's what God expects. So he says, judge between us in our vineyard, verse 4. He says, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in, in it? Why then, uh, why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless grape or worthless ones? So he says, God says, I've done everything for my vineyard, and it didn't produce what it was supposed to produce. Now, here's an interesting question. Doesn't God know what was going to happen? There is a theology that, that's called the open theology. And open theology means that God didn't really know what was going to happen when he made everything. But as it happens, he then 
kind of goes with it and has to fix it or manipulate it. And so he didn't know about it. That's called open theology. And there's some people that believe that. And here's, you know, one of the types of verses that they take because it says here, God says, what more could I have done for my vineyard? It didn't produce what I wanted to produce, so God didn't know. Well, I don't think that's really true. I think what it means is that God's just talking to us from the standpoint of a vineyard owner who's trying to get fruit and he's trying to figure out how to get it. And that's what he's talking about. He's not, he's not saying that, that he never knew this wasn't going to happen because the Bible teaches that, that even before the world was formed, God already planned for Jesus to, to die if necessary. God already planned it. And so it's not something God didn't know about or God hadn't planned in his, in his wisdom. Okay, now verse 5, he says, So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges, and it will be, it will be consumed. I will break down its walls, and it will become uh, a trampling ground. I will lay it waste. It will, it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also uh, charge the clouds to rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. And so basically what he's saying in here is he's giving us the illustration of a vineyard owner who comes to his vineyard and he finds it not producing fruit. So what do you do? If, if you're a vineyard owner and, you're, and your purpose for having a vineyard is to produce fruit, and you have a vineyard that doesn't produce fruit, what do you do? You pull it up. And sometimes you see that, don't you? Like uh, as you're driving down the countryside, you'll, there'll be an old vineyard maybe, and, and you'll see tractors pulling out the old vines. Well, why are they doing that? Because it's not producing anything for the owner. And that's what God is saying here about Israel here. Israel didn't produce anything, didn't produce the fruit that God wanted them to produce. They, they weren't producing that. Okay, and so what's he going to do? He's going to lay them waste. Now, from physical standpoint of Israel, God laid them waste. They went off into Assyrian captivity. God was laying them waste because they weren't doing his will. Now, there, there is a sense, though it's not, it's not a universal statement, but generally speaking, if you don't do what God says, what happens in your life? Things go wrong. If you don't do what God says, things go wrong in your life. Now, you might say, yeah, but I know some people that they, they're not doing anything right and things seem to be going okay. Well, they're kind of the exception to the rule, but they're not spiritually right with God. Just because somebody's rich or somebody's happy doesn't mean they're right with God. They just don't know they're not right with God. That, that's the problem. But the general rule is, if you don't do what God says, there's going to be trouble in your life. That's the general rule. And that's still the general rule today from a physical standpoint. If we don't do what God says, what's going to happen? The Bible says, discipline your children. What's going to happen if you don't discipline your children? They're going to become disobedient, like me, right? They're, they're going to become disobedient, okay? Uh, God says you're supposed to uh, take care of your property. What happens if you don't? It's going to deteriorate, and you're going to end up, you know, squandering a, a, a benefit that God gave you. So from a physical standpoint, this is still true, but he's really talking about the spiritual standpoint, and he's talking about, uh, about the fruit that he wanted to get. And the fruit that he wanted to get, uh, and the reason that, that God allowed them to be trampled by the Assyrians and Judah to be trampled by the Babylonians is because they didn't receive the fruit he wanted. Now, what's the fruit he wanted? Well, take a look at verse 7. He said, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah his delightful plant. So he says, I'm not talking about a physical vineyard. I'm talking about my people. And he says, Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. So when, you, when you're, a, when you're a, a grape grower, what do you expect to find on your, on your vines? Grapes. Well, God says, I'm not really talking about grapes, but there's fruit. Well, what's the fruit that God expects to find when he put man on the earth? What was the fruit? Justice. And righteousness. That's what God expected to find. And I've told you that when uh, man, God put man here, he put us in his image because he wanted us to be just and right. He wanted us to produce justice and righteousness. But instead, the world became wicked, and that's what you see here. He says he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. Instead of doing what was right, what did they find? 
people hurting each other, killing each other, right? And then he says, and for righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. You might go, what does that mean? Well, instead of helping people because they're doing right, they would oppress people. And the people that they oppress would cry to the Lord. And so instead of the earth being filled with righteousness and justice, it was filled, in this case, with violence and people in distress and bloodshed and people moaning and, 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 talk, and crying to God because they're being abused, because they're being hurt, because they're being um, killed, assaulted, whatever. And, and that's what you see. And so in America, you're going to find more and more of that all the time because America is leaving God. And when you leave God, that's what's going to happen. God, first of all, gives us little signals. He, he tries to discipline us to get us back. Kind of like when our, when our children misbehave, we don't just whack them to, right off the bat. We tell them. And then we warn them, you're going to get in trouble if you, if you keep doing this. Uh, and, and then finally, we get to the point where we have to discipline them. Uh, and, and sometimes that discipline means sending them to the room or, or not, you know, not sending them to the room without eating or sending them to the room without their telephones or their, or their games or whatever. Sometimes we, you know, get to the seat of the problem sometimes. But, but, you, but you, you do that uh, because they're not producing the fruit that you want from your children. That, that's why you do it. And if you love them, you do it. So God expected the world to be filled with justice and righteousness. But what did he, and Israel was supposed to be the people who demonstrated that. That's what they were supposed to demonstrate. But what are they demonstrating? Idolatry, abusing people, taking bribes, not being, not, not being helpful, being greedy, selfish, right? Remember the chapter before where we read about the men who were arrogant and proud, and we read about the women that would walk with tinkling bells and seductive eyes. That's not what God wanted. God wanted people who had justice and righteousness, not people who oppressed one another and hurt one another, but people who helped one another. And so beginning in verse 8, you have the same thing that you have in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24, I believe it's 24, Somehow, all of a sudden, that doesn't seem right to me. Let me get there and look real quick. No, it's uh, 23, sorry. In, in Matthew chapter 23, uh, it's the same thing you have there. In Matthew 23, you have seven woes on the scribes and the Pharisees. You have these seven woes, woes that are being described. And here, in chapter 5, notice verse 8 says, woe. This Isaiah 5, 8 says, woe. Uh, notice in verse uh, 20, it says, woe, 21, woe, 22, woe, and I believe there's one more, maybe not, but anyway, so you have the same thing here that, that he's telling the wicked nation that basically he told the leaders in uh, Matthew chapter 23. You know, when we read that, and he, he went, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you, you know, for, for you, uh, devour widows' houses, pretending to pray, and, and you bind heavy burdens on men, but you won't lift them. You remember all those? Right. Well, it didn't start back then. That wasn't the first time God said that kind of stuff. Look at what he says here in Isaiah 5 and verse 8. He said, Woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there is no more room so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. You might say, well, what's that talking about? Well, that's talking about people who devour and steal their neighbor's property next to them, and they end up having these huge, gigantic land uh, 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 properties, you know, that they slowly devoured their neighbor's property by lying and stealing and cheating and, and, and abusing them, uh, and they ended up having this big piece of property with their house right in the middle. So it's, it's not talking about depression is talking about people who are rich and devour other people's possessions. And so if, if, if you run a business, if, if, if you uh, own a business, uh, your job is certainly to make a profit, but you also need to take care of your people. You also need to provide for them and, and, not, and not be overly concerned with what I'm going to get and what I'm going to make and forget about the people who help me. Uh, and therefore, you have difficulty if that's your attitude. Well, that was Israel's attitude. That they were in it for the money. And so, therefore, they had these houses where there was one house in the middle of the big piece of property, and they had stolen it by getting the, the inheritance of the people that lived around them. Because you remember that each person had their own inheritance. 
Each person was given their own, their own plot of land. In verse 9, he says, In my ears the Lord of hosts has sworn, Surely many houses shall become desolate, even great and fine ones, without occupancy. In other words, he's saying that even though you guys are doing this, it's not going to protect you. God, God is going to turn your house, even though it's on 10 acres, your house is going to be vacant. Because when Assyria comes, does Assyria come and go, ah, let's just pick on the poor people. Is that who Assyria picks on when they come? Who do they pick on? Everybody. Everybody. The rich people as well. Matter of fact, they start with the rich people, don't they? Because they're the ones that have the property and the money. In verse 10, he says, here's what happens. For 10, acre, for 10 acres of vineyard would yield only one bath of wine, and an omer of seed will yield a, 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 but a, an ephod of grain. Now, remember that earlier in chapter 5, he said that because of their wickedness, God was going to shut up the skies. Remember that? He was going to stop the rain. Well, what happens if you stop the rain? Nothing grows. You can plant seed, but if there's no water, what's going to happen? It's not going to grow. And by the way, an, an ephod is a tenth of an omer. So you use a hundred bags of seed and you plant it, but you only get 10 bags of produce. How good is that of an investment? Now nah, you're losing all the time, aren't you? And so as a result of that, they're going to, they're going to be in distress. Look at verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may pursue strong drink, who stay up late in the evening, that they, may inflame the, that they may inflame themselves. Their banquets are accompanied by lyre and harp, by tambourine and flute, and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord, nor do they consider the works of his hands. In other words, when you watch television and you happen to pass through some of those reality shows like The uh, Bachelorette or the, or the Bachelor or um, the... There's one about some, some yacht people that own yachts and the, and the crew, and they're always partying. It's about partying. And kids watch and they go, that's what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to party all the time. Well, that's what these guys are doing. They're partying all the time. That's, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, and, and so he says they, they get up early and they pursue strong drink. I can't wait. You know, till it, till it gets past noon so I can have a martini or I can have a, um, some booze and, and get drunk and party because that's what I want to do. I can't wait to party. And they go after strong drink and they stay up late that they may inflame themselves. The idea of inflaming themselves is the idea of getting drunk. They're going to inflame themselves with wine because that's what they're, they're going to party. They're going to live the good life. That's what they're going to have. Uh, there used to be a show on called... Uh, uh, I think it was called My Cribs or The Cribs or something like that. And, and it showed you all of the wealthy people's houses. And I can just imagine kids looking, oh, that's what I want. I want one of those houses. You know, that's what I want, you know, with, with all those expensive cars and all those, uh, all those uh, big houses and, and, and fancy, fancy kitchens and, and, you know, swimming pools and, and jacuzzi. That's what I want. Well, that's what they're seeing on television. That's what television is saying is important. That's what really matters. How many, how many television shows do you see that show people sacrificing for other people? People giving up for other people? Do you, you see any of those? And if you do, how long do they last? Not very much longer, do they? But this is the kind of stuff that's going on there. It's the kind of stuff that's going on today. People, people are wanting stuff, and these guys are partying all the time. And, and, and so he says, the problem is, in verse 12, is he says, the banquets are accompanied by lyre and harp, by tambourines and flutes and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord. So I don't think God is, is saying you can't have a good time. What God is saying is, is if you're having a good time, you better pay attention to what? What the Lord says. So if you're having a good time, you go, I'm going to get drunk. Is that what you're supposed to do? Or you say, I'm going to have a good time and party and find some girls to sleep with. No. You can have a party, stay faithful to your wife. You can have a party, don't get drunk. You can have a party, think about other people. So God doesn't mind us celebrating. Matter of fact, what was the very first miracle Jesus did? Turning water into wine at a wedding celebration. So he's not telling you you can't party. What he's saying is these people, all they care about is partying and they don't care about God. They don't care about the deeds of God. And he says, nor do they consider the work of his hands. In other words, they don't even think that there's a God. They, they don't even consider God and what God does. He says, verse 13, Therefore my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge, and their honorable men are, are famished. 
uh, and their multitude is parched with thirst. Now, when he says that, he's talking about when they go off into captivity here. When they go off into captivity, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about that while they have all this good stuff. When they have all this good stuff and they're partying, they're drinking all the time. But when Assyria comes and carries them away, what are they going to be drinking? They might get a cup of water every day from their, from their uh, guards. And, that, and that's if the guards like them, that they might get that. Because what we need to understand is that God and our relationship with God is a long-term process. It's not like McDonald's where you get your food right away. Uh, I'll serve God and give me blessing right now. No. We serve God, and no matter what happens in our life, we know he's going to bless us. It might, we might not get the blessing until the end of our life. It took Israel 40 years to finally get into the promised land. God didn't give us that picture just to tell us they were bad. He's telling us that's the picture of life. It might take your whole lifetime for God to cultivate you and to remove sin from you so that in the end he can be glorified in you. And we be, and we'll be glorified in him. And so verse four says, Therefore Sheol has enlarged its throats and opened its mouth without measure, and Jerusalem's uh, splendor, her multitude, her din of uh, rivalry, and the jubilant within her uh, descend into it. In other words, what he's saying is that they're going to go off into Sheol. Now, if you have the King James, it might say hell there. But really, the word is Sheol, which means the grave, which means death. What happens up here to a lot of the people when Assyria invaded, what happened to them? They got killed. They ended up in the grave. They ended up in Sheol. They ended up dead. That's why they ended up. Now, here's what I want us to understand. Every single one of us is going to end up there. Even the faithful are going to end up there when this life is over. We're all going to die. The question is not, are you going to die? The question is, how do you live before you die so that when you do die, you can be right with God? I guarantee you there were individuals here who died, right here in both these cases, that were actually faithful to God. Amen. But they died because there was a war. Amen. And they died just like the other people died. But the difference is, is that when they died, they were looking past death to the real reward. They weren't just looking through the drive through What do I get right now? They were looking to heaven. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, and I believe it's verse 10, when it talks about Abraham, it says Abraham sojourned in a, in a land he didn't know because he was looking for a city whose foundation and builder was God. He was looking to the future. I believe one of the biggest problems that we as parents have is getting our children to see the future. Even when it comes to what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Oh, no, I'll stay home, play games. Nope. You got to do something, okay? And our world isn't really conducive to, are you looking to the future? Our world is to the here and to the right now that's under consideration. That, that's what he's talking about. And so they're going to go off into splendor. And what's going to happen? Well, verse 15, who's going to be punished? He says, so the common man will be humbled and the man of, of importance abased. The eyes of the proud will also be abased. Now, when he says the humble man here, he's talking about the man who bows down to the idols. He humbles himself to the idols. Is that who we're supposed to humble ourselves to? No. We're supposed to humble ourselves to God. But these people humble themselves to the idol, and that's why they're proud, and God says he's going to bring, the, he's going to bring them down. And so we see that over here. We see that there. Now, that hasn't changed over here, even in the church. If you're in the church and you're proud and arrogant, what's God going to do? He's going to humble you. He might humble you a whole lot here to try to get you to repent before the time comes. But if you, if, you, if, you, if you still don't humble yourself to him, then in the day of judgment, he's going to do his thing. But God, that's what God's going to do. Okay? He's going, he's going to base you. Now, verse 16. But the, I, but the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. Now, how does God's judgment show him righteous? Give you an example. Chad, my judgment is let's go to a strip club. What, what does that show you? That shows you my judgment's bad. But if I say, hey, Chad, 
Let's not go to the strip club. We shouldn't be going to the strip club. Yeah. Now that's good judgment, right? That's what God's saying. That's what, he's, that's what he's trying to point out. He says God's judgment is going to be exalted. God's judgment is a holy judgment. Holiness is going to reign. Remember why, uh, what God said he wanted the earth filled with? The glory of the Lord. He wants the earth filled with God's judgments. But what are the people filling it with? Violence and wickedness. I mean, look at our world today. Okay? I mean, some of the commercials you see on television... They're, just the commercials are immoral. Looking at, looking at the commercials that they have, they're awful. But God's judgment is going to be true. If God doesn't judge his people here and judge his people there, when they commit idolatry and they murder one another and they, and, and they, and they offer their babies to Moloch and they commit adultery with other people, if God, if God doesn't punish them, what does that say about God? He doesn't care about those things. God does. And that's what's kind of sad about the church. Because the church has kind of incorporated all the same practices in the church that you have in the world. And so a lot of people don't see the difference between the church and the world. Because you have just as many divorces in the church that you do outside the church. You have just as many liars in the church that you do outside. You have hypocrites in the church like you, like you do outside. But here's what I want you to understand. God does have faithful people. He has the faithful people. Verse 17 says, Then the lambs will graze in their uh, uh, pasture, uh, and the strangers will eat in the waste places of the wealthy. In other words, the, the property of the wealthy is going to be seized by animals and by the strangers who come and capture the land. And so they're not, the, Israel isn't going to live there anymore. Other people are going to live there. And I was hoping to finish this chapter for us. We go through here, but I can't because our time is up. So we'll start in chapter 5 and verse 18 next week. Anybody have any questions or anything? Yes. That's right. What matters is when we die that we're with Christ and that we're faithful to him. And that we serve. So we'll start with Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 18. Next week, let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you that you have demonstrated for us what you expect of us. You expect of us as your people, Father, today, righteousness and justice. So we pray, Father, that we would remove in, uh, iniquity from our life, that we would remove suffering and, and the problems that we cause sometimes in other people's lives. We pray that we would learn to love people and to and to demonstrate righteousness and to act justly. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us and help us and teach us these things, Father, as we strive to do your will. We thank you so much for the way you take care of us, both physically and spiritually, and we praise you for your Son, Jesus, and the work of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we are out.